treating the soil as a chemical experiment rather than as a living entity. It resulted in much higher yields, but much poorer crops with hardly any nutrients. As a result, people are now overfed and malnourished. But by coming together in a spirit of love and cooperation to grow our food organically, using permaculture principles, we can once again become well nourished in body and mind. Stay tuned to learn more. I'm Jack Cox, author of Love Not Fear. And here's Jack's lovely book. Love it's Not wonderful. Fear. Recommend it. Get one for yourself oh, today. Book, Jack. <laughs> and I'm with my usual gorgeous co-host, Any Day, who's written two scrumptious books. Your guide to feeling fabulous, fast and orgasmic health. And we're really blessed tonight to be joined by the beautiful Juliet Yarberton who's written a gorgeous book about um, trauma. What's it called, Juliet? Uh, healing Stress, Anxiety and Fear, Simple Steps for Healing Trauma. And it's a very good book. I think I, I've read it and it's brilliant. Andrew, so, Andrew hasn't shown his book. Oh, Andrew, sorry. And this is love. It's a collection oh, I of this love. poetry. <laughs> And essays all about the wonderful subject of love in its many forms. My wonderful. favourite subject. You're going to do the song. You're going to do the song. All you need is love. What the world needs now. All you need is love. What the world needs now. All you need is love. Love. Love is all you need. <laughs> As you notice, I don't sing. I know my limitations. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know mine. <laughs> so for those of you who have been watching this channel for a while, uh, you know that I've got a pet subject that I'm very, very passionate about. Um, I mean, the governments of the world are trying to bring in this crazy central bank digital currency, aren't they, at the moment? Yeah. Uh, which will have a time limit on it so we can't save our money and accumulate wealth. Um, it'll be programmable, so if they want to bring in a uh, another lockdown, they'll be able to do so. And if they if we're not allowed to go more than five miles, then you know our credit cards won't work, or our, we won't be able to fill up our cars more than five miles from home. Now, if all that happens, and of course, it'll be tied into our social credit scores when that comes out. So if we criticise the government, then we're, we're screwed. If that comes out, money will no longer be fit for purpose. I've said this on the channel before. Money will no longer be fit for purpose. And if that happens, or preferably before that happens, uh, we need to find other ways to transact with one another without money. And I've been talking a lot on this channel about my vision for uh, an informal free gift economy. Uh, I don't pay me back, pay it forward the economy based on love and generosity instead of meanness and fear. I keep on talking about that. Now, what a wonderful way to start. I can't think of a better way to start than community gardens, which is the subject of our talk tonight. Yeah. And it's why Juliet's joined us tonight to talk about her wonderful community garden in, uh, in Glastonbury in Somerset. By growing food communally, in a spirit of love and cooperation. We can free ourselves from the need to buy food from the supermarkets. And, and my dream, one day soon, hopefully, is that we can open up some of these community gardens to people with different skills other than gardening. So if you've been feeding the plumber all summer and your pipes burst, You'll be jolly glad that you have. Yeah. Certainly, if you if, if you can't spend your central bank digital currency to employ him, yeah. Yeah. So, on the subject of community gardens, what got you started, Julian? What got you started in getting? What made you think about starting one? 
Well, I've always gardened since um, as early as I can remember. And uh, I started uh, a self-sufficient garden, a small holding, when I was 20. And um, kept goats and rabbits and chickens and geese and so on. And uh, I loved that lifestyle. And uh, then a little later, I, uh, for eight years, I was in France, self-sufficient, and grew everything and uh, had a herd of goats. And uh, I, I just love nature. I can't understand food in a plastic bag or in a tin or anything else. It's, it's like if you're not eating it fresh, then there is no vitality. And, and food is, nourishment is so much more than what you put in your mouth. It's the whole process of, of being engaged with the, the growing of the food and the nurturing and, and the nurturing of the environment, the land, your body, connection with spirit and so on. So I know that not everyone can do this. And uh, many people don't even have the skills anymore. I know that these skills are really, really lost. And uh, because it's not just the skill of the growing, it's when you when you have the food, when you have the harvest, as indeed you do when you when you grow food, it gives you such an abundance. It's like, what do you do with all the surplus? How do you preserve it? How, how do you actually set it aside so that you have it for the months when when the sun isn't shining and, and God isn't growing the food for you? And uh, so there's a process there of harvesting the food and then what you do with it, whether you're, you're dehydrating it, you're making conserves, jams, uh, storing it, storing your potatoes and your pumpkins and so on. So all that knowledge around how you take care of your food is largely lost alongside having lost the ability to grow food. And that made me, made me really sad that that was happening. So when I, I was in France and I was self-sufficient, I had many people come and volunteer and I taught them how to do those things. And then when I came to Glass, when I returned back to Glastonbury in 2000 and um, I set up Healing Waters Sanctuary just um, a little later and there was a large piece of land with a spring attached to the sanctuary and so I thought this is a wonderful opportunity again to set up a community garden. And this model was slightly different because it involved um, lots of other people being engaged in that um, project and not just that I was teaching them. So the model on which I base the gardens is that everybody contributes in whatever way they are able, even if they have very few skills, but they contribute in some way. Um, it was a cooperative, so even if you had no gardening skills and you were um, only had skills at making videos or doing some admin, you're an important part of the community of the gardens. And that everybody who contributed then had a share of the food. Um, and the, the produce, because it's not just food, there's medicinal herbs, there's flowers, there's community activities and so on, all of which is nourishing to the soul. So the other important part of this project is that uh, you don't have to own the land, you don't have to be able to afford the seeds, you don't have to have the tools or all the other um, accoutrements to gardening. So the, the community takes care of all those things from our shared um, input and you can come when it's in, um, possible for you and you can contribute and then you have a share. So that was the that was the new model, and and um, Jack, I really like this concept of like exchanging um, the plumbing. If somebody's doing some plumbing for you, then to mm -hmm. give something to them, and in a way, I've always done that. It's like I've always given from the gardens, whether you're a member or not, that you can come and. Um, do something else or, or or just that you come and you're sad and you're in need and and um, you know you receive a bunch of flowers or or a slice of apple pie made with apples from the garden so, you know I have, it, some your, I, I have some of your wonderful jamries it was gorgeous you did and that was all made from the gardens we have such an abundance 
if you plant a tree or you plant a garden, you have incredible abundance. And this whole concept of this whole thing that's put out about um, scarcity is such a complete lie. Mm. Because nature is always incredibly abundant. And when two humans come together, um, I don't know what the quote, I can't remember the quote from Jesus when, when one or more. Yeah, when one or more or two or more or something are gathered together, yeah. That's right. And, and that, you know, that's not just a spiritual thing. That's, I mean, community, two humans coming together and people in community coming together, that's a spiritual experience alongside being a practical experience or a social experience. So there's incredible abundance and it's very, very joyful to do that. So that was my model. That was my motivation. <laughs> so Juliet, you're, you're also a trauma therapist, aren't you? So you, and you, and you have a, a, a trauma healing, um, healing waters, which is next door to healing gardens, where you do trauma therapy and, and you work that in with the garden, don't you? The two things are connected. Yes, people can come and when when I've run workshops, for instance, I've incorporated the gardens as part of the uh, the part of the workshop experience as well. So, to go down and and engage in the gardens in some way, or if you're having some kind of other therapy, or you're coming for a retreat, it's possible to be in the gardens and do some other activity, because what do they call it? Horticultural prescriptions. I can't remember the name of it. Some. Yeah. some Kind of fancy name but it, gardening is one of the most healing practices that there is alongside you know the the connection with nature is incredibly healing and two people working together and you have this nervous system um interaction this co-regulation that's happening that's very very soothing for the nervous system and it, it feels very safe it's very containing and you have your feet on the earth at the same time, which is regulating your body from electrical activity and so on, training that from your body and negative uh, charges and so on. So it's very, very beneficial being in the garden. So that, that's the vision, really, that the, the center that people come for healing, for trauma healing and so on, and, and they actually participate in the garden as well but it doesn't have to just be people that come to uh, for a retreat it can be anyone in the community anyone that needs that solace and that time of, i mean it, they're incredibly peaceful and everyone's very welcome aren't they um regardless of people's uh, ability or knowledge or fitness uh, as long as they can actually physically get down there um yeah, everyone's they made everyone's made welcome Everyone's made welcome, absolutely. It's, a, it's, beautiful. it's such a beautiful, it's such a beautiful garden. It's such a beautiful place um, on the uh, Michael Ley line in Glastonbury. The vibes there are absolutely incredible. Um, I, I just love it, and <laughs> there's a, I really do. I mean, I, I'm in love with the place totally. And uh, there's a pond, and. Um, you you say people have seen fairies at the, around the pond. Now I don't see clearly like that. I, I just see impressions of things. But I've seen things then in that pond, around that pond at dusk. It's a really really magical place. Yes, I think it's fed from a little spring. We've had um, um, I can't remember her name. Uh, somebody came and there's, there's the the pond, the spring. So there was a spring, and we created with Patrick Whitefield, who's the um, he's now died. Uh, he's very very well known internationally. He was a friend of mine, permaculture expert, and he came and helped me create um, the landscape to capture the water from the spring to create that wildlife area because it mm. was it was really neglected before and also in the center of the field is the mother spring which also is has been channeled by um many people information about it that's one of the nine ancient springs of avalon 
that is a very powerful healing spring. It's not for drinking, but for sitting by and meditating. I've had somebody actually um, take the water and um, make some sprays, healing sprays from it. So it's I had one of those, yes. So nice. very powerful, so powerful. I mean, I, I often go down there just to meditate and to pray. It's, it's beautiful in there. Really, really beautiful. I was just going to say to Annie, you've been there, haven't you? <laughs> oh, yes, I have been there. Yes, I have been there. And it's absolutely stunningly beautiful and very <laughs> serene and tranquil. As mm. has Andrew. Did you go? Did you did you go down to the spring? Andrew, Andrew and I both stayed at Juliet's, didn't we? You did, yeah, yeah. A couple of months ago, wasn't it? Yeah. I even left a copy of the book in the bookshelf. Ah. Well done, Andrew. <laughs> I don't know if I was allowed to, but I did. <laughs> Absolutely. I've left a few of mine in there over the years, but I think they're probably all gone now. <clears throat> so sorry, Juliet, we interrupted you. Well, I was just saying that you're very welcome to leave a copy. That's very kind of you. Yeah, it's uh, so, it was it was a beautiful place, and uh, unfortunately, we were just there for one night, so we were dashing off back into town, weren't we, um, yeah. in the morning? But uh, it really did get to me that that morning. I it was quite early, probably about six o'clock, half six. I, I went out and sat uh, on the. Um, uh, the outside of, of the property and I was just looking out over the um, the valley uh, and uh, I, w I was moved to tears. It is an amazing place uh, yeah, mm -hmm. and I did share my poem with you, didn't I, Juliet, of uh, my impressions of that morning. So uh, thank you very much uh, for being led and uh, to, to open up the uh, Healing Water Sanctuary and to uh, and to maintain it for 23 years now, it's quite an amazing thing that you're doing there. Thank you. Yes, it's it's actually um, the 19th year. We haven't reached 23 quite yet, but uh, maybe in spirit I have. But um, it was quite remarkable how it happened because uh, I didn't have the means or the intention as such to um, buy that property and set it up, but it was more like that spirit kind of make it made it possible and it happened very very quickly so that's uh, that was quite amazing and so many people have had such powerful experiences and and felt so supported when they they have come so you're not the first person that said they've been moved to tears when they witnessed the land i mean the the mythology or the legends about it is that at the bottom of that field there's a hedgerow and that was the bank of the Inland Sea because Glastonbury used to be um, one of the ancient isles of Avalon and that all of this area was underwater because it's slightly below sea level and it's only got fields now that you can see because the monks drained the, um, the area. They dug ditches in the 10th century that, and started to control the influx of land. Uh, the influx of water on the land. It was also um, known as the summer lands and the apple orchards because it was underwater in the winter time. And uh, the, the legend is about Joseph of Arimathea that he came, he was a tin trader and he came, so this is the, the uncle of Jesus, by boat and there was a Roman dock in the corner of the field. So the, the, the hedgerow is the shoreline. And just in the corner of the field, there's archaeologically the remains of um, showing that it was possibly a dock there. There is some dispute as to whether it was a bit further around. But this is what I was told by an archaeologist that I know uh, that's worked in the field. And that um, Joseph at one point brought his um, nephew Jesus and hence um, William Blake wrote the song Jerusalem and did those feet in ancient times. So they the thought that it, they were referring to the arrival of Jesus here and that he actually walked on this land, that he actually walked through what is healing waters and that um, Joseph of Arimathea came on another occasion and landed and walked up the hill with his staff and put his staff in the ground the top of the hill just above where healing waters is and that grew into the holy thorn tree 
which is very, very famous. So whether this is true, whether it's a myth or whatever, it's very, it's very much capt captivated the minds and the hearts of people worldwide. Uh, and it's been a place that people come and they pray. Um, they get married by the tree. They scatter their ashes by the tree. And it, it's it's been very powerful for people for a very, very long time. Um, so much so that, unfortunately, um, about 10 years back, somebody sabotaged the tree. And there was a, a huge amount of upset. And the, the TV came and, and filmed it, and that went international, that the tree had been cut down. But it's now been replaced, because the lifespan of the tree anyway is about 100 years, and they have been, you know, the cuttings from the first tree from Joseph of Arimathea were taken and replanted and replanted. So this is a tradition that's gone on for centuries. Mm. And, and there's, um, there's lots of holy thorns around the town, aren't there? Lots of, uh, of, of daughter trees. Yes, there are. There's one in the Abbey. There's one um, St. John's Church. A, a few places. And this is, you know, it, it, it is of great significance because a cut-in was always sent to the Queen once a year. So the fact that that happens shows that it's of a, a very great significance and that Glastonbury, people come and it's, oh, it's an interesting town. But once it was a very, very... Um, um what's the word very important town in in spiritual terms because <laughs> it's actually more powerful more renowned than westminster so there was this great power battle that happened with um henry the eighth and so on and then he destroyed the abbey so when that happened then the, the whole nature of the town changed because the, there was this like taking down attempt to take down the spiritual power but you can't really diminish the spiritual power that's here, that has been here for centuries, even before Christianity arrived, even for, before Joseph of Arimathea came, or all of those Celtic saints that also had um, their hermitages on the islands around Glastonbury, like at Mere, um, like Bride is Mound. Um, I can't remember all the names, but... Um, there's a book written called The River by Bruce Garrard, and he talks that he's talking about the river that goes through Glastonbury, uh, the River Brew. And he talks about the ancient hermitages when they were all islands when and still in the inland sea in the second and third century. So, you know, that was a very, very important place for the Celtic saints then. But even going back into thousands of years before that the sense is that actually within the land it's very very powerful it's a very powerful spiritual point possibly because of the ley lines going through and that on the tour uh, there's the michael line and the mary line that inter interconnect and that the tour in itself is is believed to be a portal that helps souls to ascend when they've passed so Obviously, these myths have gone on for centuries and centuries, and that there is a very potent power here. Um, I, I don't know. I've just lived here for so long. It's just normal. <laughs> it's just normal <laughs> for me. But I've, I've, over the years, I've heard so many people come and say they've had such incredible experiences when they come here and when they come to Healing Waters, um, but not just Healing Waters, when they come to the town. Ask, is it? Um, on the tour, where yeah. um, King Arthur's body was was taken for burial, according to the legend. Uh, well, it was it was believed that he was buried in the abbey, but there is some dispute about that as well. So mm. that there are myths about King Arthur being in Scotland as well as being here, um, and in um, Normandy, I believe. Mm. So uh, the, the the King Arthur legend is another powerful legend shared around quite a lot. But Cadbury Castle, which is um, about 20 miles from here, which is a hill fort, is also believed to have been the seat of um, for King Arthur. Now, a couple of weeks ago, during all the floods, uh, you could actually see the way it would have looked when it was all flooded. The um, The water came right up to the back of of your garden, didn't it, Juliet? 
That's right, yes. Yeah. In fact, I saw it. I don't think you did. I think you were in France, but I saw it. <laughs> and it was absolutely incredible. Um, I sent you a picture, I think. It was absolutely incredible. You could just imagine the way it used to be. Such a magical place. But getting back to community gardens, you run healing, healing gardens along permaculture lines, don't you? That's right, yes. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Okay, so the ethos is that we do not cause any harm. We kill nothing. Um, we work in balance, in harmony with nature. And um, it's very much about listening and watching and, and seeing what wants to grow in many places and, and just just supporting the plants where they want to be and what, you know, insects. So it's really working with biodiversity, encouraging biodiversity and um, working along those principles of loving kindness, compassion, no harm and protection, protection of all life, basically. We have a herd of deer in the field. Um, there's been bats, there's been um, not too many rabbits, fortunately, because they can be quite uh, quite hungry at times. <laughs> now, there's foxes, there's badgers, there's lots of different insects, and we have some bees there as well, and, and lots and lots of wildflowers that the bees love. And in spring, it's amazing because often all these poppies appear. I mean, not just little red poppies, but big poppies. That's a great poppies. It's always very surprising what one can find. Mm -hmm. Who looks after the bees? Uh, Matthew, somebody called Matthew. He's an amazing healer who lives out at Mere. And mm -hmm. uh, I highly oh. recommend Matthew oh. Jack. Matt. I've heard, I've heard people talk about Matt in Mere. Is that the same guy, the healer? Uh, Quite possibly, I don't know who, yeah. who you were hearing mm. about, but yes, he lives uh, here, and and he's the son of Dr. Jackson, who used to have a practice in Glastonbury. Right. He's an absolutely amazing healer. Um, he does um, acupuncture, osteopathy, Chinese herbs. Uh, he's very skilled, and he's got a lot of um, technology. He, he's been investing in all sorts of equipment for la lasers and scanners and um, pulsing magnetic um, P PMF, pulsing mm. electromagnetic something, I can't remember. But he's got lots of things to help people with um, difficult, uh, difficult illnesses, difficult things like hairline fractures and things like that. I'm definitely the same guy, absolutely. Um, there used to be hens, didn't there, at one time? Hens? Mm. Yes, we used to have hens. We um, we had quite a lot, about 50 that I rescued from, um, apparently from a, um, what do you call it, a free-range facility, which wasn't mm. a free-range facility. It's, uh, it's so dishonest, a lot of the advertising when you buy things from supermarkets. So they say free-range eggs, but uh, they mean usually... Um, eggs from chickens that have been kept in a barn. So these poor chickens that were free range were absolutely featherless when I rescued them. Well, barn hens aren't free range hens. They're totally different, uh, totally different thing. A friend of mine had um, barn hens a few years back, and I was always having a go, a go at him about them because they were in, in terrible condition. Yeah, it's very sad. I think chickens mm. are so sensitive and so intelligent and it's just a very very cruel the way that, the way they're treated mm, absolutely we've got the polytunnel and we've got a couple of orchards that uh, we've had such an amazing crop this year of apples i've um, got enough apples stored um up until april and i've made lots and lots of jam and chutney and as well as apples plums, incredible harvest of plums this year, and damsons and pears. Do you make preserves, Annie? Um, yes, I do, yeah. Gams We've or had just... crab apples from the allotment. We've had cooking apples. We've had, um, they're sort of like Granny Smith apples as well, but there's an abundance of blackberries there as well. Mm. So, yeah, lots for me to go at, basically. <laughs> 
keep you busy. Yeah. So, so what's the latest project, Juliet? You've got a, a, a community space you're trying to create in a in, in a shepherd's hut. Yes, we're fundraising. Hut. That's right. We're fundraising um, to make a community space with the shepherds up down in the garden. So it's it's really nice for, because once you go down there, it's like you don't want to be walking up and down if it rains, and it's good to be able to have somewhere to go and sit or mm. to make. A tea or or to sit and talk and share uh to relax especially if you're a little bit elderly or a little bit um poorly or tired <laughs> it's just good to have that kind of space to relax and and to to actually share some time you know some quality time with somebody to sit and chat and in comfort instead of out in the elements because it can be very wet sometimes because of course, this is what the garden's really about, isn't it? It's not just food, although that's important. It's the community, and it's the healing, and it's it's the spiritual development. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And that's, and that's why we need the space. Absolutely, that's why we need the space to sit and uh, be together to to share and. You know, it's incredibly healing if you've got something on your mind or or weighing down on your heart. If you can actually sit. In, in a quiet, calm place, but also in nature. So the, the space, the shepherd's hut, is very kind of surrounded by nature, that you can have that quiet space to be, you know, to actually share. But it's going to be quite expensive to convert, yeah? Yeah, it's... it's um, I don't know what you mean by quite expensive. Well, the need to raise funds. Absolutely. Um, the, the funds that I'm trying to raise absolutely don't represent the whole cost of it. it it's just a contribution. So I've already put in quite a lot of that. And we've got um, volunteers that are also working on transforming the space. So it's if, if people um, would like to contribute, that would make a tremendous difference because then we're all working together to make this happen. And that's what's powerful, the same as with the polytunnel. Then we, we worked together and made it happen. And the fundraiser that we're working with, so it's um it's called Seed Money, and it's it's run by Roger Dorian in the United States. And he's been building this up over many years and he supports community gardens all over the world. And Healing Gardens is one of the community gardens that he supports. And I've been working with him for about the last uh, five years on different fundraising projects. And when we fundraise, he then gives some matched funding to us as well. So he's supporting us. And he's been very instrumental because he's very, very passionate about community gardens. And he even um, got Obama, President Obama, to plant, to turn his front garden into a vegetable plot. So I'm told whether that's true or not, I don't know. Incredible. I'm, I'm, I'm friends with Roger and he's been very supportive. So thank you to everybody that's helped so far over the years. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if it wasn't for all the help and support of everybody. So thank you very much. Well, I've been rather pushing this uh, fundraiser that we're doing this, this week and next week. Um, Julia has very kindly, I, mean, I think it's a great privilege, uh, allowed me to make some reels and videos and things about it. Um, and uh, I shall put the link in the show notes if anybody wants to contribute, and please, please do if you can. Um, and for those who don't go looking in the show notes, uh, there's a shortcut link you can use which is the normal one for this channel, which is um, www.lovenotfear.uk and then slash fundraiser. So please do contribute if you can. Nanny, are you a gardener? I so am, yeah, absolutely. I share um, a community allotment with the Stand in the Park people from Stafford. And any excess produce, so we've been on canning courses and all sorts of things for what we can do with it. But the most significant thing for me, because 
like Jack, I'm very interested in paying it forward. Um, we've been, we were given the land for a year free of charge, and then this year we've had to pay. But all the excess vegetables and fruit that we had, um, the community larder in Stafford take it. So it's a really lovely way of being able to give people organic vegetables and fruit that they wouldn't normally be able to either afford or access, basically. It's a wonderful feeling to do that. Oh, it mm. is, it really is. It makes it all worthwhile, doesn't it, when you know that you're supporting people. Now, so many of these skills have sort of fallen into disuse, haven't they? They need to be brought back. People need to be taught how to do these things. Yeah, we can inspire and empower people just by being a good role model and letting them see how we plant. And, you know, this links into our radio show that we did do on permaculture and sustainable work farming didn't we so um you know people just need to be reminded of what we've always done jack we've always gardened in a sustainable way we've covered so many subjects haven't we over the years <laughs> um, we've covered permaculture we've covered we done a we did, did a show on glastonbury yeah uh, i did a, a short one about uh, about the glastonbury thorn yeah um, last time i was here uh we've done oh i don't know so we've many done fairies different. we've done dragons and unicorns we've done giants we've done inappropriate sex education in primary schools um uh, we've done all sorts of things haven't we so um so maybe we all... anybody who's going to listen to this on youtube when it's uploaded i would suggest that you have a look what we did on permaculture and sustainable farming because I think there's a quite significant links, isn't there, between yeah. that program and what we're talking about today? A lot of overlap, yeah. But that's good. It's reinforcing the message. Yeah. That's the uh, link for the bottom of the uh, show, isn't it? Uh, the permaculture um, show that you did. You you should put the link for that underneath yeah, here. Yeah. Oh, we'll do. Yeah. Maybe we ought to do a show on. Making preserves, bottling and canning and fermenting and you up for that, Annie? It's probably better to do it in the autumn, isn't it? I was gonna say, I think we've missed the boat for this year. We're at the end of November. Right. There isn't, fat, there isn't a fat lot for us to can and jam like with now, so No. Maybe yeah, we'll do it next year, Jack, for sure. All right, all right. Juliet was very busy earlier in the year, weren't you? Um, bottling and canning and, and making chutneys. And... I was, and, I, and I've got uh, quite a substantial food supply here, which also I share out with people. We don't know what's happening at the moment in the world. Um, mm. Things are very, very unstable. And uh, I won't say too much about it because you're on YouTube and YouTube is very touchy, but um, I'm just taking care by setting aside a lot of things and, and um, a big, big uh, amount of preserves from the gardens. Yay. I think everybody who watches this show, Juliet, knows exactly what you're talking about. You don't have to spell it out. We're, yeah. we're, we're all on the same wavelength. Yeah. We know exactly what you mean. And, th and that's the other thing about the gardens. Anyone who wants to come and engage in the gardens, they also would be able to put away a lot of preserves because there's so much abundance and there's the, the capacity for so much more than yeah. what I utilize myself. So we definitely need some more volunteers. If anybody's in Glastonbury and wants to pop down, I'm there most days. Andrew? I can see you want to say something. Not particularly. I'm just, uh, as usual, um, very pleased to be here. Um, my, I'm just thinking about um, the garden and so on. My, my dad always wanted to, when he retired, he he wanted to have an allotment. He wanted to um, have a greenhouse. And he did have a little bit of a greenhouse before he retired. But sadly, he had a, a massive heart attack 
he actually died and oh. they brought him back and he stayed with us another 20 years after that um and said if, if there was ever a miracle it was doug smith he was brought into um he was doa and they worked on him for half an hour and he came uh back but after that he really didn't have the he was on a lot of medication so he just didn't have the get up and go to get up and go and oh. uh so that was a bit sad, but I, I always was aware um, he had a cigarette card. Um, <laughs> they used to put little cards in in the cigarettes. They used to do it in sweet cigarettes when I was a little lad. But the, it was actually a thing back in the the 1930s, 1940s, and he kept all these ones about gardening. So he obviously had a very big heart for gardening and I never took the advantage of speaking with him about it. And when I'm here, you know, talking about permaculture or or what we're talking about this evening, I just think, I'm sorry, Dad, I should have engaged you in conversation about mm -hmm. that because you could have told me so much. So, um, yeah, I, I I do believe that we, we need to be self-sufficient away from the supermarkets. So, Juliet, what you're doing and what many other people like Juliet are doing, um, we need to go and learn. You know, the, the people who say, oh, I couldn't do that. No, neither could I, but if I was nearest to Glastonbury, I want to go and learn how to do it. So it's a skill that can be passed on uh, to uh, future generations because it's been lost. Absolutely. Of course, there are, there are community gardens everywhere. Nearly every town has got one now. Yeah. Uh, and if there isn't one near you, then start Stop. one. Uh, Juliet, have you got any tips for anybody who wants to start a community garden? Oh, my goodness. Now <laughs> hmm? um, I'll put you on the spot. Well, the circumstances could be so different. So um, I think you need to have a passion for gardening first of all if you want to start a community garden um because unless you do then it, it's going to be a bit more difficult isn't it or or to have someone that has a passion for gardening and uh, i think it, it would be wonderful if there's a community garden everywhere so that no one has to do things on their own and they can learn well my vision as you know as i've said earlier um, is for these groups based around community gardens, but not limited to community gardens, to grow in size until they grow into one another. Yeah. Well, that's and the it. Whole world, the whole world is one big don't <laughs> pay it back, pay it forward community. Well, that one day. takes us back a few decades, doesn't it? Half a century or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but the Michael Tellinger One Small Town vision is very similar to that, isn't it? Yeah. Michael Challenger is very, very similar, got very similar ideas to me. Uh, when I wrote my book, I, I hadn't heard of Michael Challenger. And it's very hard to convince people of that because they all think I nicked the idea from him. But uh, yeah, they have very, very similar ideas. Yeah, that's right. Carry on, Annie. Okay, so you if have well. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, if well planned, a community garden can offer people a place to relax, a way to engage with nature, meet others and get active outside. So if you're just starting off, you could identify a location for the garden. As I said, uh, Stand in the Park community has one um, in Stafford that's very successful. Um, but you could search the local council, the UK government website, to find out who's the landowner to seek permission for your project. Engage as many people as you can and find out what sort of garden people would like and how they would like to use it. You could contact local groups, schools, businesses to get people involved and talk about the potential benefits of a community garden project and space. Consider a time scale for the garden to be cleaned completed and agree a simple plan. So studies like the one conducted by Lackey and Associates have shown that community gardeners and their children eat healthier, have more nutrient rich diets than do non gardening families. 
One health benefit that might surprise you relates to asthma in children, where a recent study of community gardens found that eating locally produced food reduces asthma rates because children are able to consume manageable amounts of local pollen and develop immunities. And I thought that was really important to stress that. Gardens can be areas for recreation and exercise. According to the Journal of Preventative Medicine, the creation of or enhanced access to places for physical activities combined with informational outreach produced a 48.4% increase in frequency of physical activity in addition to a 5.1% median increase in aerobic capacity, reduced body fat, weight loss, improved flexibility and energy. All thanks to the gardens. Absolutely, brilliant things. That's wonderful. Um, if you'll excuse me, I need to uh, leave now. Well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing all that with us, Juliet. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to share with you, Annie. Thank you. Hope to see you sometime, and you, Benjamin. Thank you. Bar ba not Barnaby. Barnaby. Barnabas. Barnab <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> I booked in as Andrew, so that might have confused you. Who's this Barnabas who uh, who said <laughs> that they stayed at the Healing Water Sanctuary? I haven't taken a booking for Barnabas. <laughs> you did for Andrew. <laughs> We've all changed our names once or twice, haven't we? Eh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, be well, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, you Juliet. Juliet. Thank you, thank you ever so much for coming thank on. You. Bye. All of Grove's participant gardeners reported a reduction <laughs> in stress through their regular community garden participation, as well as a general feeling of well-being. Exposure to green spaces reduces stress, increases a sense of wellness and belonging, according to Bremer et al. 2013. A 10% increase in nearby green space was found to decrease a person's health complaints and an amount equivalent to a five-year reduction in that person's age. Preserves green space, developing and maintaining garden space is less expensive than parkland, in part because gardens require little land and 80% of their cost is in labour. So if you've got your community doing it, then there's no labour cost. Community gardens provide a place to retreat. So set yourself a budget. Have a little think about ways that you may want to fundraise. Set up a volunteer-led community organising group to manage the project. Find out if any local gardeners, landscapers or builders would be interested in lending a hand. Work out the orientation of your site, north, south, east and west. This will influence what you can grow. Survey the site, walk around it and make a list of all the features or objects. Are there paths or sheds you would like to keep? There most certainly is on the community one in Stafford. So we've got more sheds and we've got benches and chairs strategically placed. So if you just want to sun yourself or you just want to have a little rest from your labours, you can do that. Check to see if any of the trees have a preservation order on them or are in a conservation area and look to keep habitats that already support wildlife. Perhaps there are materials that can be salvaged and repurposed. Well, we've got loads of pallets that have been used to make the furniture and the latest sheds. What are the goals of a community garden? Many cities and organisations provide opportunities for residents to become involved with their local community gardens. The goal is to provide better access to healthy food and to promote social activities that could possibly reduce the crime rate. 
Some of the benefits of developing a community garden include improvement of nutrition, physical activity, overall mental health for participants, increasing the number of neighbourhood gardens can also support the environment by positively affecting people's mindfulness about earthing and grounding. Community gardens encourage residents to become more socially and physically active and to develop stronger ties to the area. I think as well that one of the lovely things about a communal garden is every time I go to the allotment, there's somebody there that you can have a chat with. So there's always, you know, there's always going to be somebody that you can talk to. Gardens provide nutritional value through the growing and consumption of organic fruit and vegetables, in addition to relief from stress and urban and sedentary lifestyles. So why would you want to start a community garden? A community garden benefits your local community in several ways. The most obvious is in the plants or produce grown, which bring food and beauty to the local community. In one research study published in the Journal of Nutrition, Education and Behaviour, 2022, Researchers found that households with one family member involved in a community garden consumed 1.4 more servings of fruits and vegetables per day than those who did not participate. So I think particularly young families where money's short, that could make a really big difference. Just one person from your family that grows produce. It's a no-brainer, really, isn't it? It is it's really, darling. Enough. Really is, isn't it? And I know how grateful people are. So my neighbours, my family, my friends have benefited from the veg that I've grown in my own garden and also from the um, allotment as well. It makes a really big difference to know that they've been grown with love and that they were organic seeds that we used. You know, all of that's really important, isn't it? I mean, as I said at the beginning of this, that the food you get in the supermarkets is crap. Mm. There's no nutrients in it. Yeah. It tastes, it tastes, it does taste of nothing. Yeah. So these public spaces also serve as a gathering point for the local communities, bringing together the neighbourhood with the common goal of growing plants. They can serve as a beautiful focal point in the community and often they provide a fresh food source to underserved populations. And community gardens can teach children and young people about horticulture and where their food comes from. So quite often I'm surprised that young people and children don't know where their food comes from basically that's true so if you feel that a community garden would be an asset to your community then you need to get started on getting cracking as you think about how to begin maybe consider these steps find your available lands we were very fortunate that we were offered that land free of charge but not everybody's that fortunate so before you can build your garden, you must have a spot for it. Look around your community and find land that is available near water and with decent soil or enough ground to build containers. <laughs> Vacant lots are often a great option as long as you can get permission from the lot owner to build the garden there for the growing season. You, might you can often get a, you often find a farmer that lets let you yeah. have a bit of field, can't you? Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. you know, you can negotiate that you'll give him some of your produce when you've grown something rather than paying rent, if that's what you fancy. Yeah. So engage your community. Once you find a space, get started on building engagement within your community. You'll need a team to help build the community garden. So reach out to others who may be interested. And one of the best ways I've discovered to build excitement about your 
garden is to talk to people find an opportunity to talk to people the more passionate you are the more engaging it will be um that you could also do <clears throat> crowdfunding as you raise funds in the community for the supplies <coughs> that you may need it may also generate interest in your garden ask participants to brainstorm ideas for how to subdivide the plots and get more people to participate as you get more people on board be sure to outline the roles and responsibilities of members for example you may want to indicate who is responsible for keeping the weeds at bay and who is harvesting from the garden determine your budget and again, you can ask about, people are quite happy. We got all the pallets that we've made, the sheds and the um, and the furniture. They were all donated to us from a message that we put on Facebook. So determine your budget, then create a plan for raising the funds. Fundraising efforts from garden members are a good starting place, but you may want to look at community garden grants or there is also corporate sponsorship, especially for those early startup costs. Planning for the size of your garden is also important. The size should be based on the number of plots you hope to rent out. A plot can be anything from 100 to 500 square feet or littler. There are people at the allotment currently that have got smaller ones so there's three people for example sharing one plot so it's not too much for everybody what produce would meet the most important needs of your local community why not focus on these while you may have grand ideas about planting a variety of fruits and vegetables make sure you consider the local climate available sunlight soil conditions since you won't have a lot of equipment available to tend your garden you'll be relying on local community members you want to plant things that will grow well in your local area by uh, plant a garden i know we've done that bit already um whether you've got individual plots or individual beds determine how composting will be handled and how you will protect the space while keeping it accessible for members. Um, a community garden can be a beautiful addition to your community if you put in a little time and effort. You can add benches and chairs and storage to make it more user friendly as well. So <clears throat> one of the people at um, the allotment is called Matt and he's made us little sort of boxes that you can put all your equipment in instead of carting all that round with you as well. Watering schedule. Who will water your garden? Well, currently we all water our own plot. <laughs> and then we um, message each other on Stafford Tree of Life about if anybody's going to be away on holiday that somebody else will water their particular bit as and we take it in turns oh, excuse me so weeding schedule how will you manage your weeds so um one of the things that we've done is to we don't use any sprays or chemicals we just do companion planting <coughs> so most of the organic seeds we've grown at home until they're a bit hardier and they're able to go into the ground we have used netting to stop the pigeons eating everything <coughs> and um, we've put finer nets over our produce so that the little butterflies didn't get in and lay their eggs <laughs> oh excuse me once the garden is growing keep it going strong by promoting involvement throughout the year so having regular meetings 
community events and meals in the garden can renew interest in the space and bring in new garden members. So one of the things we did at the summer solstice was we had a big bonfire with all the stuff that really needed to go. And um, we used a barbecue as well while we were there. So it gave people an opportunity to bring their own booze or their own water, whatever they were drinking. And then we had this community feast, which you know and I know, Jack, whenever there's a shared supper or a shared lunch, there's always tons of beautiful, beautiful food, isn't there? And again, it encourages you know, children and younger people to be taking part in it as well. Um, community, so we've done a community events and meals. It can also generate support from local businesses who may wish to serve as your sponsors. You can even create a farm to table experience by making meals using produce <coughs> from the garden. Sharing the success of your harvest if you have an excessively bountiful harvest, give it away to others to share the benefits of the community garden or donate it. So as goes to um, the local food pantry, it's called the community larder. And um, I know that there are a lot of food banks, but they don't have fresh produce. So that's what's different about the Stafford community larder that they will take fresh produce and especially when it's organic most mm. of the families that are accessing the community larder food are on a low budget or low income should we say in a fixed income as well so it's a really lovely way of sharing our excess basically the more eyes you get on your garden the greater its overall success will be Keep up with the basic maintenance on your garden, Sue, so it remains a beautiful, productive, wonderful asset for you and your local community. Brilliant, Annie. Right, you were mentioning earlier about um, gardens, garden yeah. sharing. Yeah. Now, I, I mentioned this before on the show, but I've got a, a little website that's not really doing a lot, but in, you know, you're very welcome to use it. Anyone's welcome to use it. Right. It's called gardensharing.net. Oh, that's quite handy. <laughs> so if you've, got, if you've got a plot of land, just, just a garden, just your back garden or something, or any, any plot of land, uh, you know, a farmer's field or any plot of land, and you want to get somebody to grow organic food on it on a, a crop sharing basis then go to like www.gardensharing.net www right and definitely you also, need to put them in the show notes baby yeah and you can also register your community garden there okay so please make use of the website it's there for the use of and it's all free perfect Brilliant. Anything you want to say, and 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 um, Barnabas, I keep getting your name wrong. No, you can call me what you like as long as it's pleasant. Um, as long as I don't call you late for dinner, right? All right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I heard somebody call, "Hey, you, cloth lugs, pardon." Um, so <laughs> couldn't hear him. Uh, so <laughs> that's why they call me cloth lugs. So uh, yeah, as far as um. The, the website, you've spoken about that before, Jack. The idea that maybe this, this some old deer got a huge garden at the back of a house. It's overgrown. There's nothing there, yeah. just weeds and and grass and uh, maybe a couple of trees or something. That if she's willing to, because it's her land, she could her give land. that she could give uh, that over to um, just some one person who gardens, and then they can get 
food out of it and she yeah. can be given food as well exactly. she won't have to go down the shop and get the uh, uh, and get the produce from um the uh, supermarket where there's no nutrients she could get some nutrients out of her own garden and as annie was saying earlier the pollen the local pollen will keep her yeah. healthy so yeah, it, it's oh, absolutely a brilliant <laughs> idea but if nobody actually puts it forward, no one actually speaks about it, and no one has a website about it, thank you, Jack, then <laughs> there's, there's nothing going to happen. So yeah. there is that opportunity now. Um, 515, is it? Or I don't know how many your latest number is. Uh, people who have access to your... Uh, have actually said that they're interested in what's on here. If they yeah. listen uh, through to this show... It it may just spark a load of yeah. community gardens everywhere, yeah. and and wouldn't yeah. that be a great uh, contribution to society that the show had made amongst all the other informative things that you brought to us? So again, thank you for tonight, both of you, and to Julia as well, because obviously she's doing that every day and has been for yeah. I was corrected, is it seventeen years, yeah. uh, nineteen <laughs> years? Sorry. Um, so uh, it, it, it really is important that these skills are not lost and that they are at least spoken of and yeah. people are at least aware of them and that uh, where do you get your food from? The supermarket. No, you get it from the ground. <laughs> yeah, that's the difference, sweetie, isn't it? And I think people... this will inspire and empower people. Yeah, people have lost the connection between food and land. They think food comes from supermarkets. Well, it's worse than that, isn't it? Because we are um, of the land. We, um, according to the, the Bible, it, it talks about uh, God bringing together bits of clay and, and manufacturing, well, no, making, creating, rather, uh, this human yeah. being, Adam. Uh, and so we're actually made out of the ground. And when you go to a funeral, they say from... Uh, from from dust to dust, from ashes to ashes, don't they? And they're actually committing the elements of the physicality that was you, because you're a spirit and you've gone elsewhere. But that is is committed back to the ground, because that's what we we are actually the men of and, and women of the earth. So yeah. it's it's even better than what we've just been saying there. That um, you know, that that we need to understand the land. We are the land. You yeah. know, I am an yeah. earth man. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and and that's really important that we have our own connection with with the soil in yeah. ourselves. Just even just walking on on the the grass uh, yeah, in the yeah. summertime with bare feet and, yeah. and grounding yourself. Th that's been mentioned in this show tonight yeah. about yeah. Re releasing all the ele electrical um, charges that have been. Yeah put into us through our modern society, just yeah. grounding, uh, just a little walk in the woods behind me here. That's perfect. You know, yeah, just absolutely, do it. and uh, Barnabas. <laughs> I tell you what, people people talk an awful lot about taking their shoes off and walking on the grass, and walking it on, on the soil, and that's brilliant. But nobody ever talks about taking their gloves off and getting their hands in the, in the soil and breaking up clods of earth. It's just as good for grounding. You silly sod. Yes, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I never wear right. gloves. I never wear gloves. And the lady that does my beautiful nails is always appalled and gone, any day, ladies who have nails like this do not, uh, you know, do not guard them with their bare hands. I was like, well, I do. I do. <laughs> Uh, you're a proper earth child, Annie. I am indeed, me darling, and you are. Right, let's wrap it up. Okay. Thank you ever so much, my gorgeous co-host, Annie Day. Thank you, Jack. And my good friend, Barnabas. And the Thank you for lovely, having me. And the, the lovely Judy at Yarbrough, who was on earlier. And uh, as usual, uh, all the notes will be in the, in the show notes, all the links will be in the show notes. Please do like, share, and subscribe if you haven't done already. And we'll see you all again next week. Namaste. Namaste.